last week we, um, we had uh, a message about the wonderful miracle of Jesus um, having great compassion on a blind man named Bartimaeus. And how uh, John, John spoke about how um, leading up to Palm Sunday, this was, um, this was a good thing. Um, and then uh, Palm Sunday came, and, and uh, we spoke about Palm Sunday because we're just after Easter. Uh, so I jumped ahead to Palm Sunday to speak that just before Easter. And now um, we're going to continue on. So, you know, all of these miracles happened prior to Palm Sunday. I mean, Bartimaeus, I mean, it's not a glorious miracle. This guy who is in desperate need of seeing came to Jesus, and Jesus had compassion on him and, and healed him and restored his sight and how God desires us to come with our needs. That's what a wonderful message that was. And, you know, right in, in with Bartimaeus, just before Jesus entered Jerusalem on that triumphal entry on Palm Sunday, we see that Jesus um, raised Lazarus from the dead as well, right? So these wonderful things had happened, and, and when Jesus um, entered the city of Jerusalem, and he started coming into the city of Jerusalem, everyone was excited because of these wonderful, compassionate miracles that had been done in their midst. They were so excited to come into, to see Jesus coming into Jerusalem. And he was riding on a colt and they took palm branches and they were waving the palm branches saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And laying down their cloaks before the, the donkey's colt as the Savior rode in. And they were, there was high hopes, high hopes that Jesus was going to take his rightful throne in Jerusalem and, and become the king. And you can just imagine the, uh, the disciples and, and wondering and awe as they saw Lazarus come forth from the tomb and as they saw blind Bartimaeus' his eyes opened and the people shouting Hosanna as Jesus was walking to this city. The disciples were no doubt feeling, oh man, what's going to happen next? This is going to be great. Well, Jesus had told them that he was coming to Jerusalem and that he was going to be handed over, in fact, to sinners. And he was going to die and three days later be raised from the dead. So Jesus had told them that, but in the climate of Jesus coming into the city of Jerusalem, we can see that um, maybe it didn't quite happen the way that um, they thought it was going to happen. So today, in our text today, we pick up where that triumphant entry into Jerusalem, where that leaves off. So, after Jesus entered the city and after the crowds dissipated, we're told that Jesus went straight to the temple with his disciples and he had a look around, but because it was uh, late in the day, they retreated out of the city of Jerusalem to a little town called Bethany. That's where Lazarus was raised from the dead. So they walked out of Jerusalem, kind of to the southeast of Jerusalem, and up the Mount of Olives over the top, and Bethany was kind of on the other side, close, in close proximity to the Mount of Olives. And then, this is where we pick up in our text. Would you turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 11? 12 to 14 is where we're going to start. And coming on the cusp of a great miracle that was done in compassion to bring a blind man his sight, I get to speak on the only miracle in the Bible, only miracle in the New Testament from Jesus that's associated with a curse. Let's get into this. Mark 11, 12 to 14. The next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, 
he went out to find out if it had any fruit. And when he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. And then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Now our text reveals to us here that the Lord Jesus was was really hungry and, and he saw a fig tree and leaf. And when he went up to this tree, he found that it didn't have any fruit. And, and he said, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. So this tree had been producing fruit in the past, but it stopped producing fruit. And there was no fruit when the Savior came. Now, I've been pondering about this particular story and this incident. And, and why, God, why did you include this particular story in the New Testament? Wouldn't you think? Like when you read this, it's kind of an unusual story to be included in the scriptures. Now, God must have really had a good reason for it, and I believe he did. Now, we know from the teachings of Christ as we go through the New Testament, we know that um, Jesus often talked in parables, right? He talked in stories, uh, bringing practical life scenarios to light through a story that had a deeper spiritual principle that was being taught. But, you know, Jesus in his, in his parables, they, he often talked about negative outcomes when people were disobedient. Parables were used to explain different things. Sometimes there were, there were negative outcomes from disobedience. But, but regarding miracles, the Son of God came full of grace and truth. And God in the flesh... He was set forth to to us as people as the embodiment of love and compassion. And, 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 you know, you look at all these other miracles, healing blinded eyes, right? Cleansing people from all sorts of different ailments. Feeding people when they were hungry by the thousands. Rescuing his disciples from the ravages of a storm that was sure to take their lives if he hadn't been there. And delivering some people from the bondage they had to the darkness when they were filled with demon spirits. Jesus set them free. Jesus opened the eyes. He cleansed the lepers. He he made lame people walk. He did all these things. Why? These wonderful miracles were, were meant to display the loving kindness of our God flowing from the Lord Jesus Christ. And this miracle that, we're gonna, that we just read about here, okay, this actually, there's an ending to this. This particular miracle is introduced in Mark 11, 12. It involves a different kind of scenario than all of the other miracles that Jesus did. It involved a curse. Not a curse on a soul, such as a a human being, you know, made in the image of God, or or even an animal, or an insect, or anything. No, there was no feelings involved with this. It was a curse on a tree. So, yeah, you know, trees don't talk. As much as you see it on the movies, maybe somewhere along the line, someone puts animation to, to trees, but they don't, no. There was no curse on people here. It was a curse on a tree. Now, you see, in addition to being fully God in the flesh, Jesus was also fully human. The scriptures teach us very clearly that Jesus is fully God. God the Son is part of the Holy Trinity. He's fully God. Yet, he is also fully man. And the Son of Man, when he was walking here, he got hungry sometimes. You guys know what it's like to be hungry. Maybe we don't know very well because we have food every day. But we do feel that hunger. He was hungry and and when he saw this fig tree with leaves on it, he approached it expecting to find fruit. And with a normal fig tree, I don't know if you know much about figs, but probably not. I mean, it's not like we have figs in our backyard. 
But when they start to leaf, the fruit starts to grow at the base of the leaf. So with a normal fig tree, when a fig tree is mature, um, it can be expected to produ produce fruit uh, once or twice a year. And, and uh, it's very, actually very unusual for a mature fig tree not to have fruit. But there is occasion where a mature fig tree doesn't have fruit. I did a little research on fig trees. And uh, I discovered that under certain conditions, yeah, the fig tree, the mature fig tree full, in full leaf might not have fruit or have very little fruit. And the condition is that if the soil that the tree is planted in has too much nitrogen, it cuts out the fruit production. So if the soil that the tree is planted in, there's, no, there's too much nitrogen, you won't get fruit on that tree. So that must have been the scenario that Jesus came upon is this tree. Um, and, and the thing is, because of the soil that this tree was in, not only did it not bear fruit, where, wherever somehow uh, someone put nitrate in the soil around there too much or whatever, I don't know. At one point it had borne fruit, but now because of the condition of the soil that it was in, it wasn't bearing fruit anymore, and it likely would never bear fruit again unless somehow the condition of the soil which it's rooted in was changed. So Jesus finds this promising source of food a very great disappointment. And this is where the miracle begins. Because fig trees are meant to produce figs, and this one would likely never produce, Jesus decides to use this fig tree as a parallel to the spiritual condition that he was finding in the religious system of Israel that he has walked into. He pronounces this curse on the plant, telling the tree in full hearing of his disciples, may people never eat fruit from it again. And the very action of Jesus speaking to the fig tree in this way was an illustration of what he was seeing take place in the religious community of Israel at that time. Now, if you study the scriptures closely, you'll see that it is filled with a common theme. God is holy. He's holy. God is righteous. He's holy. He's a loving God, but he's holy. There is no shadow of turning within him. There is no darkness within the Lord. He's completely holy. And, and when he created human beings in his image, he created human beings with a hunger to see the fruit of righteousness on the people that he created. So he's got a hunger for that. And Jesus, people, Jesus came to the people he created and, and to their religious system. He came to his own. He was born of Mary, was incarnated in the flesh, and he came to his people, the people of Israel, a nation that was called by God to be an ambassador nation to the rest of the earth to show them what it was like to be in connection with God. And when he came, when he came, although from a distance, the nation, the religious system appeared to be this wonderful leaf, leafing fig tree and mm, right, if you're hungry for righteousness, maybe there's some fruit on that tree to satisfy. But upon closer look, when he comes up to the tree, he sees in fact leaf, but no fruit disappointing. It was barren. And because of the maturity of the tree and its barrenness, it was never likely going to produce fruit because of the great care it had been taken to plant it. Somehow, the soil got corrupted. Maybe God knew this. And he, he, he's using this as an illustration to show that we cannot bear fruit in our own. The children of Israel, they tried to keep the law of God. They had the Ten Commandments. They had the law of Moses. They tried as much as they humanly could possibly try on their own strength to be holy. 
and found themselves going off, off the rails. In fact, the more humans try on their own strength to be holy, the more arrogant they become because they cling to the things that they think they've got and they get blinded to the things that aren't. And everybody is a sinner. All manners, all men are sinners. All women are sinners. Children, you guys were born into sin and you have the sin nature. And no matter how hard you try to be righteous on your own, to be holy on your own, to be good on your own, you can come to church and do all the right things and try and do the right things and, and still fall far short of what God desires. Because through effort with man on his own, there is no fruit of the Spirit. The hungering Savior he didn't talk to the pine trees, if there were pine trees around there, or the fir trees. I'm sure they don't have fir trees in Israel. Maybe they do. Does anyone know? I, maybe they do. Maybe in certain places. I know when we were there, there was different kinds of trees. But he never spoke to the coniferous trees. He never spoke to the you know, maple trees or oak trees or elm trees or whatever they have over there. He didn't speak to them, sycamore trees. Because... He knew that he created them and they, weren't, they didn't have fruit. He spoke to the tree that was supposed to produce fruit. But this tree was not fulfilling its divine purpose. Just as Israel had tried in its own strength to fulfill its purpose and was not fulfilling its purpose in being a light to the Gentiles, and being an ambassador nation for the Lord God to the world. So after Israel would reject the Messiah, Jesus knew that this was going to happen, that he was going to be despised and rejected by men. All these accolades that were happening on the triumphal entry because of all the wonderful things he was giving to the people in his grace, this was to show the character of God. He is a good God. He is a loving God. He is a healing God. He is a compassionate God. That's what he, he had done. But he said, I'm going to be despised and rejected by men because they, my ambassador nation, has instead of being righteous and bearing the fruit of righteousness, they're, bring, they're, they're barren. They're just green leaves. It's all window dressing. Concerning this passage of scripture, the great preacher of last century, I guess it's two centuries ago now, Charles Spurgeon, he once said, what is this symbolic teaching concerning this verse? The curse falls on its metaphorical and spiritual meaning upon those high professors who are destitute of true holiness, upon those who manifest great show of leaves but bring forth no fruit unto God, only one thunderbolt, and that is for boasting pretenders, only one curse, and that is for hypocrites. O oh, blessed Spirit, write this heart-searching truth upon our hearts. You see, my friends, because we're born with the same nature as those Israelites were, before we start going, oh, those Israelites, you know, they had all that, and look what they did, you know. Yes, it wasn't right, but before we get too critical... We need to take a stop and look and say, yeah, you know what? My heart gravitates that way too. There's some days when if I look in the mirror and I'm truly honest with myself and maybe you too, I look in the mirror and I go, are you bearing the fruit of righteousness in your life? And the other person looking in the mirror who is me goes, you know what? Maybe not always. Maybe less than what God would desire. Oh Lord, have mercy on your people. Have mercy on us. You see, God knows, God knows that in our own strength, people 
we're going to lose our temper. We're not going to have the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, you know, all that. You know what I mean? Just hit your nail, hit your finger or thumb with a hammer and find out. <laughs> find out what comes out, you know? Now, I know for me, sometimes when I've hurt myself, I found myself swearing. I'm being honest with you. Whether it's picked up at work or whatever, it's not something I do regularly, but, oh. And then you just go, what is this? You know, I'm a minister of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and here I bang my finger with a whatever hammer or I squish it under something, and ow! And then I found myself saying uh, the poo-poo word. Hey, pastors are human, and, I, and I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that I've got it all together because I don't. But one thing is for sure, okay? When we fail to meet the standard of righteousness that God desires, we have an advocate who speaks on our behalf. And we go to him and we say, Jesus, I love you, Lord. I don't want to be this way. I'm sorry. Please forgive me, Jesus, and help me to, to live a life that pleases you. For this is all I desire, Lord. God's looking for people that desire to have a heart that pleases him. And the Jews of the day of Jesus, they rejected their Messiah and they turned away from the author of life when he invited them. But the Bible says that as many as received him, to them gave he the power to be the sons of God. And what this means is that there is a way for us to see righteousness flourish in our life, to see the fruit of the Holy Spirit bearing heavily upon the branches of our lives. And the way is not by doing it more and doing it better and trying harder. No, it's not that way. You can't. You can't be better. You can't earn your way to God and his grace. Grace is not earned. It's a gift of God. It's freely given and freely received. You can't earn it. I can't earn it. But true grace, my friends, leads to holiness. See, God didn't give us grace through Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of our sins to just give us a get-out-of-jail-free card so we can wallow around in the muck of the world. No, he didn't give us his grace to be trampled upon like that. He gave us his grace because the Holy Spirit of God is holy. And when the Holy Spirit of God moves into our hearts, we become holy because he is holy. And when we yield our lives to the power of the Holy Spirit, there is a washing and a cleansing that occurs as we walk in him. Because he lives in us. Jesus didn't stay dead when he died on the cross. He rose from the grave conquering sin so we no longer have to be bound by the things that we don't want to do anymore and those things that we want to do we can do them in the power that comes through God's spirit as we yield to him my friends what I'm saying here Jesus was saying that the Israelites had this barrenness on the branches of their lives because it was all done through human effort. The Pharisees, you know, what did he call them? Whitewashed tombs full of old, a dead man's bones. That's what he called them. Because they had the windows washed. You know, when you look across the church in North America, well, what do you see? I see some people that dearly love God and are, and are wanting to serve him and wanting to live for him and, and many people in this assembly. I see that. I'm rejoicing over it because I'm with you. I want to be holy. I want to live for God. I want to be a light for this town to see Jesus because without Jesus, there is no salvation. People are lost out there and we're called to be ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
We're called to be his ambassadors and called to speak his word as though he was making his appeal through us, just like Paul. Paul says, you know, you should follow Christ, follow me as I follow Christ. That's how Paul lived. But across North America, I've seen this. People that come to church just for form, just because they think it's another thing on the checklist that's going to bring them, um, bring them salvation. It's like, you know, I'm not saying don't come to church. You need to come to church to be fed, to be nourished, to be encouraged, and to encourage and nourish and feed others. You see, that's the thing. We don't come here. This is not like the movie theater where you pay your 20 bucks and you come to see the show. That's not what it's all about. This is a family. This is, this is a calling that God calls us into. And he wants us to bear much fruit. Not just to come and put on a window dressing and check the box off that we've done a good thing here this week and now we can go about our way. Jesus wants us to be looking in the mirror, my friends, and asking the hard question, is the fruit being born off of the branches of my life? And if it is not, why not, God? Am I approaching you as a consumer approaches something that he can get out of it for himself but has no interest in anyone else? Is that how it is? That's not what Christianity is in its pure form that Jesus taught. Well, my friends, when we look in the mirror, God's calling us to evaluate our heart. And the Lord, if there be any wicked way in me, please take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Man, young men, young ladies in this place. You can get taught all the Bible verses. You can go through Sunday school and Awana and youth group and all that. You can have all this head knowledge, but until that head knowledge connects to your heart, you're not saved. We can know everything about Christianity and still not be saved. Why? Because we haven't submitted our heart our spirit, to, to the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we say we believe, what does that mean? What is belief? I have to ask myself that question. Do I just go to the mirror and say, yeah, I see this, and then turn around, walk away, and forget all about it? Do I come to church on Sunday morning and have this great experience and this good feeling and hear this good teaching, and then after I go, it just sort of... <laughs> out and then I go about my regular activity. Where is my heart in the week? What is the fruit of the week? We need to ask ourselves this. And if we see barrenness, my friends, we need to repent. Jesus is coming soon. And there's instructions in the word. John chapter 15, 1 to 8, Jesus said, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. So it will be even more fruitful. I've said this before. 2020 and 21 has been a great time of pruning. Have you felt it? Have you felt the shears of the loving God cutting off the shooters that are drawing energy away from fruit in your life? If you haven't, I counsel you to look And see, because I think he is in everybody. As a leader, it's been the hardest two years of my life. Seeing what's happened out there and, oh, just everything. It's been so difficult. But in the difficulty, all of your issues, right? Your personal issues and corporate issues float to the surface. They come to the surface. And God's interested in what? What is he interested in? Good fruit, right? God's interested in good fruit. He wants you to bear good fruit. 
He wants me to bear good fruit. He wants our church to be fruitful and hanging heavy with the fruit of righteousness. So that when we go out there, when people see us, they say, you have something that I don't have. You have something that I don't have. What is it? And then we can share the gospel with them. And the Spirit gives us the strength and the words to say and to live our lives out, to be compassionate out there in word and in deed. So the fruit. God wants us to be more fruitful, so he prunes us. And there's some people, I'm afraid, that come to church and under the smiling exterior... Under the polish of dressing up nicely and the face that is put on, there is an icicle heart. And I pray that none of us here today or who are hearing this message have that heart. But if we do, now is the time to bow. And say, Jesus, have mercy upon me, son of David. I'm blind. Even though I know the scriptures and I've known them from childhood, I'm blind. I can't see the truth for what it is. Help me. Help me, Lord, to see. Help me. Son of David, have mercy upon me. If that's you today, you need to call. God's calling you. What you do with that. If you turn away, if you turn away and turn away, And you just put up the window dressing. You can be as religious as you like. You can go to church five times a week and go to every prayer meeting that is. And if all it is is a window dressing for something else, maybe it's for social reasons. Maybe it's because it promotes your business. It's good to be in a place where there's hundreds of people because there you've got business connections. Make a little bit of extra money off that. You know? If that's where your heart is, one of these days, it's going to be too late. And the great shears of the Almighty will shear you off of the vine of salvation. Your heart will be hard and you won't be able to come back. Now is the day for salvation. Now is the time to humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. Do it. I appeal to you. Do it. God calls you. But he's not going to force you. He doesn't force people. But he appeals. He appeals. Come to life in Jesus. You don't need religion. You don't need religion. You need Jesus. Hebrews emphasizes this too. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed, receives a blessing from God. Receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. My friends, Not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, on the day when we stand before the judgment seat, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this in your name? Didn't I do that in your name? Didn't I even, you know, cast out demons in your name and do these miracle things in your name? And what does he say? He's going to say to some people on that day, away from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. I never knew you. Oh, people. Let not that be us when we come to that day. Only God knows the heart. I'm speaking to you here today. Today, if you hear the voice of the Spirit speaking through the word here today, don't harden your hearts to the voice of the Holy Spirit because he's calling to you to repent and to come to him. He desires not that men be lost, but desires that all come to a saving knowledge of him. Therefore, the gospel goes forth. So, Jesus, 
He was grieved by the coldness of the religion of the Jewish people of his day, and they were in danger of being cut off because of their lack of fruit. They were leafy trees that didn't fulfill their calling and were heading towards this curse. And this is why Jesus cursed the fig tree as an illustration to his disciples of where hardened, dead, legalistic, human pride-based religion is headed. Man, you can't earn your way to, the, to salvation. You can't. The scriptures say it is by grace that you are saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. So we continue reading in verse 15 of our text. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, it is, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. So you see, the various leaders of the people of that religious community, they were in God's temple the physical temple of God, and they were selling sacrifices, but reality was that their hearts were very far from him. They were fig trees without fruit. Everything that they were doing in that place was religiously driven. It was all done selfishly for themselves, and they were in it for personal gain, and despite all this ceremony and pomp and friendships that they had with all the people that they greeted in the temple courts, and celebrations they had, and the feasts they had. They were not, their hearts were not what God was seeking. And this made Jesus angry. This is the only time where Jesus result, like where he goes and does something like this. What makes God angry? People profiteering, looking at what they can get out of their religious ceremonies, at the exclusion of people that need to be saved. And this applies to the church today. My friends, if we are focused so much upon ourselves and our enjoyment and our feasts and our celebrations and even our church services, but we have not the heart of God for the lost, we have missed the point. The heart of God is to see sinners come to repentance and come into the kingdom that is everlasting to everlasting. God's kingdom will not end, my friends. And you are called as Christ's ambassador. I'm not saying it's wrong to have celebration. Anyone like celebrations? I love celebrations. I like our potlucks that we have every second week now. Glad that we could get back to it. Gets you, gives you a chance to get to know people better. That's great. You know, we're not against celebrations and and having some fun and enjoying each other's company and getting to know people and socializing and all that. That's great, but the focus cannot be on ourselves. The focus must be on Jesus and his great commission for us that he's given us. If we lose touch with this, we come to church and we're window dressing, right? Invest. God's calling people to investment. Um, yeah, they were focused, the temple, right? They were focused on feeding themselves. They were focused on making some money off of the connections they had in the temple courts. And guess where they were doing it all? They were doing it all in the court of the Gentiles. So what happened was they pushed the Gentiles out of the temple area and instead were selling all their stuff for sacrifices in the court of the Gentiles. And that's why Jesus says, is it not written, my house shall be a prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of robbers? Oh, my friends. Do you see the application? Do you see the application? And I know this is hard, right? This is a very hard sermon to preach because... I want to encourage you. I want to leave you here with something that encourages your heart. But sometimes the scriptures correct us. 
Sometimes they rebuke us. And, they, and we need to be trained in righteousness. What does God desire of you? What does God desire of you? He wants your heart. Render your heart before Him. Not the outward, not the garments. Rend your heart before the Lord. And say, God, when I look in the mirror, I don't see the fruit that I know that you would want to see. So God, would you help me? Would you help me to bear more fruit? And thank you, Lord, for the time of pruning, by the way. Ouch! Oh, that hurts. Right? Because snip. Ow! Oh, Why do you have to do that? What are you doing that for? I'm doing it because I love you. That's what God says in return. For those that I love, I discipline. If you are a legitimate child of God, you're going to get disciplined. Why? Because he wants you to bear much fruit. And here today, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, He wants to bring life to you. He wants you to, to come to know him and to be satisfied by his spirit who will live within you when you, when you give your life to Jesus Christ and you say, Jesus, would you be my savior? You ask him to forgive you and he comes in. His spirit comes in and cleanses you from all of your sins. And you're made at one with God. Although before that, God was somewhere out there and you didn't know him. Now you have opportunity to know him. This is what Jesus was doing. This was his mission. That's why Jesus came to the temple and said, Hey, guys, this is not what God desires. I came to be the sacrifice that will end all sacrifices. I came to give my life as a pure, spotless Passover lamb so that when death comes to your door, you are passed over and you're given life instead of death. That's the heart of God for you. Because the other miracles leading up to this miracle, the other miracles showed the compassion and the love of a God who gave himself freely for his people. So, in closing, verse 19. Well, I, when the evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from its roots. And Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. My friends, you could be in church for 50 years and still just be on the outside looking in. And it's all been window dressing. If, that's, if, that, if your heart is not given to the Lord Jesus Christ and submitted to him. You're in danger of being like this fig tree. Don't, don't let that happen. Today is the day to get things right with God. And, and maybe you're not at that place. Maybe it's like, yeah, you know, I've, I've given my heart to Jesus and I, you know, like me, you're looking in the mirror and you go, oh, yeah. I don't really like all that I'm seeing here. Well, you know what? God desires you to bear much fruit. And um, there may be an increase that he wants to do in your life of fruit. And the only way that's going to happen is if we humble ourselves before him and we say, Jesus, can you take the wheel on my life here? I want you to take my life and, and help me to love you. See, it's not... Jesus, take my life and help me to earn my own way to do it better. Uh-uh. It's not going to work. You try to do that, you're going to fail. You've got to let go, and you've got to let God live through you. 
Before you can love others, before you can do what's righteous, the first thing is to fall in love with God. Fall in love with him. You know, in the Revelation, and this is the last scripture I'll say, I promise. In Ephesus, in Revelation, they started out really well. They were doing the right thing. But the Lord Jesus, when he spoke to the churches, he said to Ephesus, he says, yet I have this thing against you. You lost your first love. Return, repent and return to what you formerly had. Fall in love with Jesus and he'll take care of the garbage. If there's garbage that needs to come out of you, you fall in love with Jesus and he'll change your heart. Change comes from the inside out, not from the outside in. You can try all you want in your own steam and you're not going to do it. Come to Jesus, fall in love with him. Ask him to reveal himself to you through his word. The Holy Spirit will open your eyes to things that you've never seen before. And you'll grow. Maybe you've learned Bible all your life. But it's never really connected between here and here. God wants to make that connection so that you're a living, you're, you're a living breathing um, creation in Christ. Someone that is holy because he is holy. Someone that is being pruned and understands that and thanks him for it when he does. And we get a spank here and there. God's doing it because he loves us and he's going to make something good happen. Amen.